Capitalism is an economic system that has existed for about 0.1% of human history, but in that time it has managed to create a nearly extinction level event which threatens to destroy all of human life. But we're taught, either explicitly or implicitly, to not think about climate change in this way. The focus is future innovations that will save us, personal responsibility and cutting back. It's been decades now, nearly a century that the evidence for CO2 emissions causing global warming has been known, and at least 50 years since the big oil executives knew. Countless international treaties between free market economies in a system of global capitalism have been followed not by a decrease in CO2 emissions, or a leveling off of CO2 emissions, or even a reduction in growth, but an exponential explosion. Here's a chart of CO2 levels over the past 100 years. Show me where all the international treaties to limit CO2 emissions were. The trial of green capitalism is over. There is a class of people who own our economy and who profit from this process. And then there's the rest of us who disagree and protest against the system which is threatening our lives against our will. But the capitalist class who poison our air and warm our planet and prevent every peaceful and managed transition away from carbon pollution towards a solution, and who make their money by killing and destroying our environment, have cleverly branded us with our peaceful mass demonstrations and direct action the eco-terrorists. Even when a new story does acknowledge the fact that there is a small group of heavy polluters, it's never the system that enables them to do so which is questioned or even mentioned. They all operate under the philosophy of individualism. They see not society or economic systems, but just individuals. Capitalism isn't even an economic system to them. There are no economic systems. It's just the way that things are and always have been. Again, it's individual problems. It's just Taylor Swift or whoever it is, not the system that enables her. Somehow, every climate change discussion ignores the fact that we do not have control over our economy. There is a small group of people who we allow to have final say over how our economy operates. But somehow, this vital, key part of the climate crisis is never mentioned. Lunacy. Many people whose main squeeze is climate change and the environment often think, and rightfully so, that they have cut through the weeds. They've seen through all the falsehoods, the derisions, and are truly living in the age of Aquarius. Well, I'm not here to shed on them. Climate change is real, and it's, to put it lightly, really, really bad. I'm here to give them ammo to shit on other environmentalists. Something that might be obvious from my videos is that I'm a materialist. I view the world as being influenced by material conditions, how we actually physically do things, and what the relationships are between the people who physically do those things. I love the dialectic. This video is a discussion on climate change from a materialist point of view. So if you feel like you're into that sort of thing, or just want a new perspective on climate change to set yourself apart at the next Extinction Rebellion meeting, grab yourself your favorite beverage and let's have a discussion. But first, a word about the Patreon. Currently, I do not run ads on my channel for a multitude of reasons, chief among them being that I don't want to personally profit from what I see as a visceral invasion of privacy. I use uBlock Origin, and I encourage all of you to do the same. I also release all of my videos under Creative Commons Share Alike, because I disagree with how copyright works. So if I were to be paid to make these videos, the only way would be through community funding, like Patreon. Becoming a patron gets your name in the credits, patron-exclusive updates, and early access to videos. I will always keep the amount of money that I make public, and post how much time I spend on each video when it gets posted. You also only get charged when I release a video. Consider supporting me if you've got two bucks to spare each month. The links are where they usually are. Now back to the video. Let's get down to brass tacks. The economic system much of the world operates under is capitalism. This is not the only economic system. This is not the most humane economic system. This is not the most efficient economic system. This is not the natural economic system. Though capitalism is often sold as all of those things. Even more than that, the particular features of the capitalist mode of producing things are often just assumed to be the default, the only way that things are produced. Living in capitalism is like being a fish in water. Much of my critique of the current discussion of climate change is that capitalism has poisoned the well. Capitalism has operated in the discussion the same way as asking, are you embarrassed that you pissed your pants today? Not to get ahead of myself, but one of the main ways that you can see this is how we want companies to build green infrastructure instead of the government building green infrastructure. Now, socialism is not when the government does stuff. Socialism is when the government does stuff. 
and it's more socialism, the more stuff it does. And if it does a real lot of stuff, it's communism. But if your plan to solve climate change is some sort of tax on economic activity or a subsidy for green and renewable energy, you're operating within capitalism's framework. And why should you be? Say your goal is to reduce CO2 emissions, as it should be, you look and find that a lot of CO2 emissions are emitted by concrete plants. A normal person might say, well, let's stop them from using natural gas and switch to something else like electricity. Good. Do that. That's a fantastic solution. Now, if you live in the US, the next word out of someone, usually a liberal's mouth, would be a snide, smarter than thou, well, electricity just isn't economical to use. So now the discussion becomes how you're going to subsidize electricity, or tax natural gas, or how the power grid is mostly natural gas anyway, and whether your specific version of a tax scheme is fair. How about fuck you, get bent? Just because you're making money doesn't mean it's okay to kill the planet and the future of humanity. In fact, I would argue that it's worse for you to have made money doing all those things. But so, so often in climate change discussions, we assume that people have a right to make money killing other people, and our solutions are often just ways of coaxing, gently nudging them into doing it not so much. Ah, but the concrete plants in the US would all go out of business. Another example of the capitalist mindset hindering our thought. Just because something can't turn a profit doesn't mean that it's bad or shouldn't exist. Schools don't turn a profit, and in fact, they shouldn't. If the private sector won't do something because it's not profitable, that doesn't mean it doesn't need to get done or shouldn't get done. There are many things which aren't profitable, but need to get done. That's what the government's for, to do them. The end, get over yourself. The more you listen, the more you realize just how much discussion around climate action rests on how we can let rich people continue to make more money. How we can do some minor tax plan or pricing scheme, how some new innovation will let the market just sort stuff out naturally. Well, I'm here to tell you that markets are ass. The free market does not exist. Think about how often you really interact with a market anyway. When you buy groceries, do you reassess which store to go to each time, weighing the options, going into each one to find the lowest price for any given good before buying anything? Do you take into account each possible brand of cereal to buy? Hell no! You go to Walmart and get Cheerios because you're not a freak! And Walmart! Do they scan the market each day trying to find the best supplier for their store or each specific product? Hell no! They have regular orders from the same supply companies. And those supply companies? Do they scan the market each day looking for the best possible factory to buy Cheerios from? No! They have contracts for regular shipments. There are people at the distributors who know people at the Cheerios factory who place regular orders. The Cheerios factory has regular orders from the grain distributors, and the grain distributors have regular orders from grain farmers. Where exactly is the market in all of this? Contracts for shipments are redone quarterly, at most. And even then, it's usually with the same two agents, but just at a different price or amount. Production does not use markets at all. How about when you bought your phone? I guess if you don't just automatically buy the newest version, then that's a market. Same for if you don't renew your lease each year automatically. So that's maybe one economic decision per year that a market was actually used? In reality, the economy is planned. It always has been. There are contracts and regular shipments within large companies like Walmart and Boeing, and between them and their suppliers. Within companies, there is central planning, and in the economy as a whole, there is decentral planning. It's just that you and me, and most of the other 330 million Americans, don't have any say in that plan. It's for this reason why market solutions to something as big as climate change can't happen. First off, saying the market will decide just means that the rich will decide. This is why there have been many international treaties on limiting greenhouse gas emissions, and each one was a complete failure. CO2 emissions have increased after most of them. That's because the people who want CO2 reductions, us, are not in control over our economy. That's part of the picture. Sometimes agreements and tax and subsidy schemes actually do have an impact. We've had massive success in stopping damage to the ozone layer, leaded gasoline, etc. The difference between those and climate change, I argue, is the scale. People don't appreciate how big a deal climate change is economically. So let's go over that. Climate scientists deal in probabilities. It's a game of chance we're playing with our future right now. 
The 2021 IPCC report says that for us to have a 66% chance of average global temperatures rising by no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, we must limit the amount of additional CO2 or CO2 equivalent compounds released into the atmosphere to less than 400 billion tons. Above this, and we start running the risk of all that horrible stuff that you've heard about. Wet bulb temperatures straight up killing people from heat, sea level rise destroying infrastructure on the scale of a wartime bombing campaign, nuisance flooding making diseases spread like it was ancient times, and we literally won't be able to grow enough food. I mean, we currently do grow enough food for about 10 billion people, but capitalism wastes a lot of it. Soon, we actually won't be able to grow enough food to feed everyone. Say we want to avoid all of that. What's the state of the problem? The world currently emits around 36 billion tons of CO2 or CO2 equivalent compounds, I'm going to use those interchangeably in the video, each year. Full throttle and then cold turkey gets us 11 years after the report, or 10 from the release of this video, before we hit the 400 billion ton limit. That's highly unlikely, so let's do a gradual phase out, as gradual as is possible while also being realistic. Let's say around 20 years. So what's it actually going to take to completely eliminate carbon dioxide emissions? Let's look at just a single country, the United States. CO2 is released when we need energy. The US uses about 97 quadrillion BTUs of energy each year. This is energy of all forms and for all purposes. 36% is from burning petroleum or petroleum products, 32% is from burning natural gas, 11% is from coal, 5% is from biomass and the rest is from various sources that don't directly release CO2. In total, 84% of the energy used in the United States releases CO2 and will need to be replaced with some other forms of energy. 82 quadrillion BTUs will need to be sourced elsewhere, and the only real solution is electricity generation. Even if the various designs of hydrogen fuel cells aren't farces, they are new, expensive, need further development, and we don't have the time. Remember, we've got 20 years. We can't spend 15 of them, or even 10, waiting for a technology to develop and then build up in the last five. We need to start building up now, 20 year time frame. And that was being generous. 82 quadrillion BTUs is around 24 million gigawatt hours of energy. I don't know why the US uses British thermal units. So we're gonna need about 24 million gigawatt hours of new electricity generation. So where exactly are we going to get this electricity? What's the nature of the solution? The hard truth is that it has to be nuclear. Here's why. Each way of generating electricity will emit carbon dioxide, either directly, like natural gas, or indirectly, such as solar or natural gas. Luckily, much research has been done on exactly how much CO2 is generated over the entire life cycle of each type of power plant. We also know the average amount of kilowatts that a plant will generate over the course of its entire life, and so we can estimate how much CO2 is released per kilowatt hour generated at a power plant. These estimates include everything. The emissions from building the plant, to maintaining the plant, mining the materials, shipping the materials, everything. Environmentalists love to praise solar, so let's start there. Why can't solar be where we get our electricity from? The median estimate for how much CO2 will be emitted to get 1 kilowatt hour from a solar panel is 41 to 48 grams. Concentrated solar power, that fun one with the mirrors from city skylines, generates around 27 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. But again, few exist and we need to use what already works, so traditional solar panels. But that's not even the big kicker. Wind, both onshore and offshore, emits around a quarter as much CO2 per kilowatt hour, the median estimate being 11 to 12 grams. The same goes for nuclear, at around 12 grams. If we're going to be serious about eliminating carbon dioxide emissions and preventing ecological catastrophe, solar is out. We can't entertain a so-called solution that creates four times as much of the problem as a real solution. Solar is just a power source that makes bougie suburbanites feel green while living on a half acre, driving an SUV everywhere. Again, maybe you can find some pop sci news article about a promising new technology, but remember, we've got 20 years to finish building everything. We need to use what works now, not put our hopes on what are usually just a bunch of charlatans after government research grants or angel investors. But what about the horrible conditions of uranium mines, you say? Well, I raise you the horrible conditions of lithium and rare earth mines used for solar power and batteries. The only upside to nuclear in this regard is that we actually wouldn't have to mine as much as you might think if we left the ban on re-enrichment of fuel rods. Nuclear fuel rods reach end of life once they're just a tiny percent depleted. 
And if we're going to entertain the notion of promising future technologies or one-off examples, breeder reactors, which do not deplete fuel rods as they produce more fissile material than they consume, are possible. One was fully operational in 1977. Same for other types of nuclear plants which are much less likely to melt down, an incredibly small and freak occurrence anyway. On a level playing field, with fair comparisons, nuclear always wins out. But hold on, why not win? To explain, let's go to one of my favorite websites. The Energy Information Administration has a map of every piece of energy-related infrastructure in the entire country. Let's find the best wind farm in the US, a typical nuclear plant, and for shits and giggles, the best solar plant. So here's the lineup, the Alta Wind Energy Center, nameplate capacity of 1.6 gigawatts, the Topaz Solar Farm, nameplate capacity of 0.6 gigawatts, and the Susquehanna Steam Electric Station, nameplate capacity of 2.5 gigawatts. Again, this is the best wind farm, the best solar plant, and some run-of-the-mill nuclear reactor. First and foremost, let's talk area. The site for the Topaz Array is 4,700 acres. The Alta Wind Farm is 32,000 acres, although the land in between the turbines could be used for other things, but noise pollution is a real concern near wind turbines. And lastly, the nuclear plant is a mere 350, rounding up. Already we can see the first issue, land use. Not the biggest issue, seemingly, but it is something to consider. The larger an area our plant takes up, the more land we have to maintain and develop. Even if we're doing wind, that's a lot of extra wires to run across a huge area, and a lot of maintenance trucks, a lot of… well, everything. The cost to maintain an area doesn't go up linearly with area, it goes up by the square. But hold on, because these power plants are not all equal. Their nameplate capacities tell us that to actually be equivalent, we'd need to about double the size of the wind farm, and about quintuple the size of the solar farm. So actually, it's 24,000 acres for a comparable solar array, and 64,000 for a comparable wind farm. But, I hear the engineers shouting, that's also not even the full story. Nameplate capacity tells you how much energy a plant could produce at a given instant, but they don't always output that much. To actually compare, we need to look at something called their capacity factor. This is how much electricity they actually supplied at any given instant, divided by how much they could have. Average this over a time period and you get the capacity factor. The capacity factor for the wind farm is 24%, the solar farm is 27%, and the nuclear plant is 85. So actually, we would need 9 times as many wind farms, and 15 times as many solar farms to equal a single 50-year-old run-of-the-mill nuclear power plant what they need to mimic a fraction of our power. And these plants aren't unique. The EIA tracks the average capacity factors for each type of power plant as well. You can see the two types of solar, the one with the panels and the cool one with the mirrors, and wind. Wind averages around 30%, so each megawatt hour of electricity that we want to get from wind means we have to build 3 megawatt hours of capacity. But where's nuclear on this graph? Oh, I see. It's way up there above coal and natural gas. Nuclear averages 90% capacity. Not only is it three times as much as wind, but it's twice as much as natural gas. In the respective capacity factor, nuclear far and away beats out the competition. No contest. Nuclear has the highest capacity factor of any power source that we know of that's used on a commercial scale. Using 2018 estimates of capacity factor, for each nuclear power plant that we build, we could actually shut down two equivalently sized coal or natural gas plants. And just to shit on the solar nuts again, to get all of the energy that our economy needs, we would need to have solar panels covering an area about the size of Germany. This is why nuclear wins. Along with the fact that it doesn't require energy storage, which is unproven at worst and costly slash polluting at best, there's also the potential to use the excess heat from nuclear power plants in ways completely impossible for both wind and solar. But we'll get back to that. Okay, so that's power handled, but what about all the other aspects of decarbonizing our economy? Just because we have all this new electricity doesn't mean all the gas-guzzling cars and trucks and trains can use it. What exactly will a carbon-free economy look like? We need to know if we want to plan to get there. Let's talk about efficiency. Capitalism is not efficient. By its very nature, capitalism will waste resources doing twice what socialism could have done just once. 
Let me give you an example. The Soviet Union would heat many of its cities with the extra heat left over from its power plants. The heat from burning oil, natural gas, coal, whatever it was, would be pumped through underground pipes via hot water and into the radiators of apartment buildings. This style of heating is called district heating, and it was controlled via the outside air temperature for the city as a whole, and it was supplied, incredibly cheaply, unmetered to residents. The LA Times wrote an article about this system, calling it a terrible example of inefficiency and socialist waste. Russians, apparently, would simply open their windows rather than turn down the thermostat if the room got too hot. How wasteful. You see, in America, the waste heat from the power plant that would have passed through someone's apartment in Moscow was, and still is, regularly dumped into the nearest river by the power company. And instead, everyone pays to have some other company run gas lines to their house so that they can burn stuff instead. Heat which eventually just radiates into the outdoors anyway. Or they pay the power company, the company which just dumped all the excess heat it generated from burning fossil fuels into a river or into the air outside, to burn even more fuel so that they can heat their homes with electricity. Gosh, capitalism is so much more efficient. Imagine if all that waste heat passed through someone's house before it just heated up the outside air anyway. To save the planet, we need to bring this heating solution to the United States. Residential energy consumption that isn't electricity and isn't transportation is mostly from heating. A sizable chunk of energy used to be replaced can be made up without adding any new generation capacity, just by taking the heat that would normally go to waste under capitalism and freely providing it to people's homes. Where this isn't enough, heat pumps will need to be used to supplement. Heat pumps are just air conditioners that run in reverse. Because they work by moving heat rather than creating heat, they average between 200 and 400% efficiency, moving between two and four times as much energy as they consume. Counterintuitively, this really high efficiency rate, which seems impossibly high at first glance, means that you will actually get more heat in your house if a unit of fossil fuel is burned at the power plant instead of in your basement. If that unit of fossil fuel is burned at the power plant, sure there'll be substantial losses turning it into electricity and transmitting it into your house, but it'll be able to move much more heat than it contained within it. Then add on the fact that if we had district heating, the excess heat from burning it would be transmitted to your house anyway. Heating is what most of the CO2 released in residential and commercial sectors is being used for, whether a stove or a water heater. Once the bulk of that heating is done via heat pump and district heating, proven technologies decades or even centuries old, what little remains can easily be supplemented with electric resistive heating. Okay, so that's one sector. Let's move to the biggest portion of energy use, transportation. Over the past century, the United States, along with all of the other capitalist countries, have fallen for another one of capitalism's inherent inefficiencies, cars and trucks. <laughs> Production and distribution used to be more centralized. Multi-story warehouses were the norm, and they would have rail spurs directly to them for freight trains to deliver goods. A single locomotive with a single crew could deliver a kilometer-long train's worth of freight. Now, with the rise of trucking via the subsidy of roads, a single train with a single loco and a single crew has instead been replaced with one tiny locomotive and driver for each of the boxcars. We call this a semi-truck. And instead of a compact rail yard with loading docks, where boxcars could be parked incredibly close together to allow simultaneous loading and unloading, now huge swaths of otherwise usable or preservable land are eaten up by distribution centers with their giant concrete parking lots. The damage trucks do to roads is also insane. I mentioned the subsidizing of truck traffic earlier, and this is what I'm talking about. Road damage is proportional to the weight per axle raised to the fourth power. One fully loaded semi-truck does 9,600 cars worth of damage to the road. Bikes do literally nothing, by the way. Trucks destroy roads, not cars. And the fact that trucks don't pay nearly as much to maintain the roads as damage they do to it means that trucking is artificially cheap. This also means that each truck we get off the road greatly extends its lifespan, meaning less resources and energy going into repaving and maintaining them. Local rail delivery of freight used to be the norm before trucking was subsidized. Here are just a few examples of local freight being delivered by rail. To save the planet, we're going to need to completely transform freight service. Long distance trucking needs to be replaced with trains, and all of our rail lines need to be electrified. 
Electricity has been the best way to run trains for over a hundred years. Most diesel trains nowadays are actually diesel electric trains. The diesel engines are just there to generate electricity. The primary movers for the trains are electric traction motors. The reason rail lines themselves haven't been electrified and that we have to lug around giant diesel generators everywhere is because of the large upfront cost with little profitable return. Yet again, the market and capitalism fail to do what every socialist country has easily done electrify its rail lines. Local truck delivery also needs to be replaced with local rail delivery. Factories need to have rail spurs built to them, and those that can't need to be relocated. This will cut down greatly on the number of batteries and electric vehicles that we need to use to handle delivery services. Instead of truckloads being delivered to stores and factories on a small scale, boxcar loads will. And for anything smaller, it's going to be an incredibly small electric vehicle. The same capitalist inefficiency and thus carbon pollution has happened in passenger service as well. Instead of walking to work or biking to work or taking the train or the bus, everyone now must drive. Instead of making a single, very durable and comfortable car that can carry 30 to 100 people, lasts for 50 years and needs only one person driving it, now we've gotten rid of streetcars and buses. Everyone needs to have their own motors, their own sets of seats, most of which are unoccupied most of the time, and their car that also goes unused for 23 hours of the day. Think about someone riding a bike. That's about the bare minimum of moving parts and material that you actually need for someone to go 20 miles an hour from point A to point B. Now think about that one person riding in an automobile. So much waste. Now we need giant parking lots which take up even more land and require people to move even further out from cities. This makes mass transit even less convenient, more expensive to operate, and thus makes more people buy cars. Thus the cycle continues. Think of all the more useful things that could have been done with the metal and research and labor time that went into making those cars had they gone into making sturdy buses and trains instead. In fact, the capitalist class knows all of this because it was them who initially started this cycle. General Motors bought up streetcar systems across the country specifically to have them demolished and force people to buy cars. Thus, their inefficient business model was kept alive. But don't worry, the perpetrators were fined $5,000. Justice was served. To save the planet, we need to undo the past 70 years of car-centered infrastructure. Neighborhoods will have to be returned to their historic, and outside the US not so historic, walkable routes, including incentivizing bikes over cars for short length trips. Instead of the car being the one size fits all solution that actually fits no size, there will be trains for long distance travel for passengers, buses and light rail for medium sized destinations, and then small battery vehicles like e bikes or people powered things like bikes and walking for other short distances. And to make all this possible, it's not like we're going to need to live in the density of Manhattan Island either. It's the suburbs that are the problem. Let me prove it to you. Say we wanted to give each man, woman, envy, and child in the sprawling city of Phoenix their own 1,500 square feet of living space. That's not 1,500 square feet per family, by the way. That's each person. To do that, we would only need to use this much space if our height limit is three stories. This much if we allow seven stories, which is downtown Paris. Imagine building roads, rail lines, bus routes, water pipes, heating pipes, sewer pipes, stormwater pipes, electricity lines, and everything else that you can imagine in this area versus this area. Which one do you think is less costly and releases less CO2 per person? And again, this is on the higher end of the density. What would a less dense neighborhood look like? Luckily, there are many surviving examples of exactly the type of neighborhood that we would need. Here's a great example. This was built well before the car and truck focused maniacs got a hold of our planning spaces. If we continue for just two minutes down the road, we're on a walking and bike path in dense natural woodland, and the path parallels a rail line. This rail line serves industries all along it, and in the days of passenger service, served the towns all along it as well. Here's just one example. We see a sizable set of covered hoppers parked on a siding, and in the distance, the industry that they serve. From Google Earth, we see more of this operation. We're so used to giant, flat, truck-infested industry that these hilly rail-served factories look more like a model railroad than a real place. These covered hoppers will eventually be emptied here, and their contents are lifted up to a larger factory on top of the hill. And it's actually these rail cars that keep the neighborhood from before so quiet. 
Imagine if each one of these rail cars was replaced by the equivalent amount of semi trucks that it would take. The siding would need to be twice as large if they all wanted to be parked here, plus there'd need to be extra space for trucks to turn around. And it would be impermeable pavement instead of a gravelly rail bed, adding more maintenance costs for stormwater runoff. Plus, every single one of those trucks would be driving right down Main Street. The road would be destroyed in no time. People complain about the loudness of living near trains, but I assure you that the at most once per day that a train passes through this quaint town is much better and less noisy than would be a constant stream of truck traffic. Here's an industry which receives at most a few semi-trucks per week of deliveries, but it's literally across the street from that same rail line from before. This is a perfect candidate for rail-served industry in the future. Now let's move to a bigger example. This is a medium-sized industry. Even though this industrial park and the buildings that compose it were made long before any modern environmental standards, I would bet you any money that just because it's served by rail, the annual CO2 emissions are lower than a truck-served one half of its size. This is what sustainability is. It's not giant glass skyscrapers with plants all on them. It's not everyone living in horrible slums in the middle of nowhere where we're all stacked on top of each other. It's this. We've been building sustainable communities for all of human history except for the last 70 years. We just need to go back to this. And speaking of industry, that's the big chunk of CO2 emissions remaining that we haven't talked about. What it's going to take to decarbon this sector is incredibly complex and far, far beyond the scope of this video. But the complexity and intensity of the work that's needed for this solution is only further going to prove my next point, what it's actually going to take, socially. I think it's time to blow this thing, get everybody in the stuff together. Okay, three, two, one, it's jam. Capitalism is the astounding belief that the most wickedest men will do the most wickedest of things for the greatest good of everyone. So we've touched on a lot, and some of it you may have heard from other people. This is the point of the video where I'm going to provide what no one else can. A solution. See, just having the technology to solve a problem doesn't mean you have a solution. Just because you have a bunch of numbers worked out about what it's going to take also doesn't mean you have a solution. We have the technology to provide things like clean drinking water and healthy food and vaccines to everyone on Earth, but that doesn't mean that it happens. Aren't you a little tired of hearing about some new breakthrough technology that makes something cheaper or possible or whatever, only for nothing to ever come of it? Well, here's a real solution. This part of the video is what it's going to socially take to save the planet. First, the market couldn't provide the solution even if it wanted to. Let me prove it to you. For this cost estimate, I'm going to be lowballing everything. I'm going to consider just the cost of replacing our energy supply with nuclear power. Again, this is an underestimation, because converting the entire economy to carbon-free is going to be much more expensive and will only prove my point more. For starters, we need 24 million gigawatt hours of energy each year. Let's see how many nuclear plants we're actually going to need to build. The largest in the United States is the Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station, with a nameplate capacity of 3.937 gigawatts and a capacity factor of 92.55, its three units were constructed for the total cost of around $12 billion. In 2021, Palo Verde output just shy of 32,000 gigawatt hours. We're going to need 24 million gigawatt hours, so we'd have to build around 750 Palo Verdes within the next 20 years. That's an average of one new Palo Verde power plant opening each month from now until 2042. 750 new Palo Verdes would cost about $9 trillion, or about $450 billion each year for the next 20 years. And that's just an average. At the start, we're not going to be building a lot because of our gradual phase out. Towards the middle, we're going to be going much quicker. Now, considering the entire economy of the United States, around $5 trillion of capital is formed each year. And that's gross formation, not net formation. And only a tiny portion of that is in the energy sector. Even if the coal barons like Joe Manchin, and the oil barons like the Bush family, and other fossil fuel barons like the Koch brothers and ExxonMobil and Shell and ConocoPhillips wanted to eliminate their entire business and means of profit extraction, they couldn't. They don't have the capital. Again, we're looking at just the cost of building out our electricity supply. 
God knows how much extra money it's going to take to do this transition. It's surely going to be more than the $5 trillion gross capital formed each year. To solve climate change, we need massive government action in the economy. We need something on the scale of the wartime mobilization and New Deal under FDR, or the Soviet five-year plans, or Japan's industrial production board. To do all of the stuff that we want to for passenger and freight service regarding rail lines, we're going to need to nationalize the entire rail network. The United States is rather the odd one out by not having a nationalized rail service, or even nationalized rails themselves. If the highways are nationalized, why not the rail lines? Rail transport is much more suited to large central planning and organization anyway. Now I don't like to do this, but I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to assume that everyone watching this, even the most libertarian minded among us, understand why running competing train services down the same tracks with no oversight would be a bad idea. I've mentioned the US Postal Service before and how incredibly efficient they are, especially compared to every other private post and parcel provider on the planet, there's no reason that a similar decommodification of freight and even passenger transport via the nationalization of rail lines couldn't also be accomplished. There would also need to be extreme leeway for the government to move people from firms and place them to where they're most needed, to provide them free retraining and education and certification. There's tons of labor being wasted on completely unnecessary and even harmful sectors of the economy. The rich aren't just bad because all their wealth is surplus value that's extracted from their workers, it's also that, because they control so much money, they also control what our society's labor and resources actually get spent on. So much labor time and skill and education and electricity is wasted with telemarketing, advertising, public relations firms, corporate law, lawsuits, stock trading, etc. It's estimated that about half of all the jobs in modern capitalist countries are bullshit like this. Currently, the most skilled people coming out of the most well-respected universities don't use their knowledge and hard work to solve the world's problems, but instead get bought up by Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and they make technology to spy on people and make their shareholders richer, or by coming up with high-frequency trading algorithms and asset speculation to take advantage of their competitors. The new players in the financial markets, the kingpins of the future who had the capacity to reshape those markets, were a different breed. There were just thousands of these people, basically all of them with advanced degrees. I remember thinking to myself how unfortunate it was that so many engineers were joining these firms to exploit rival investors rather than solving public problems. These highly trained scientists and technicians tended to be pulled onto Wall Street by the big banks and then, after they'd learned the ropes, to move on to small, high-frequency trading shops. If we're going to get serious about solving climate change, we need to be able to take people from these industries and put them to where they're going to be more useful. We already draft kids into school in this way because it's better for society. Why not draft people out of worthless and even harmful workplaces and sectors and put them to where they can actually do good for society? This also happened under FDR with massive public works programs. It wasn't so much a drafting as they were economically coerced because of the depression, but the end result was the same. In fact, if direct government action to solve a problem isn't your cup of tea, we could just put employment quotas on different sectors or different industries or different projects. Let the market coerce people by taking them from certain sectors and putting them in others. With free job retraining, it's not that big a deal for one sector to have a quota which means they have to let people go, and another sector that has a quota which means they have to hire a bunch more. We already have quotas in this way. The rich set them, based on what they think the economy should be and for what benefits them. In fact, this makes total sense when you think about what a market is. A market produces and distributes things based on who has money, so letting the market decide something just means letting people who have money decide something. No surprises then that whenever the market decides something, it tends to produce yachts and giant houses and different ways of gambling rather than cheap healthcare or universal housing. There's this great trick that people get to play, this big lie they get to tell, that somehow a market, which again, only produces and distributes in accordance with who has money and what they want, will somehow benefit these billions of people that have no money. This is also why we're going to need steep income and wealth taxes. A maximum wage must be set along with maximum wealth. 
Anything above is taxed at 100% to prevent the needless excess when more important needs need to be met. We can't let the billionaires spend hundreds of millions on yacht improvements and vanity projects, occupying valuable labor time and skills and resources, which could go to saving all of humanity. To prevent inflation, a heavy reduction in purchasing power to those who already have more than enough is justified. During World War II, the highest income tax bracket was 90% for this exact reason. The rich are a waste. The world is a zero-sum game. We have finite resources, and finite time, and finite labor power. There is no such thing as a rising tide lifting all boats. This isn't a video game where we can just add more numbers. This is real life. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we need general planning for the entire economy. Now, I know when I say economic planning, you'll immediately think of horribleness. In fact, the main critique against economic planning is something called the economic calculation problem. Supposedly, an economy is too complex to be planned, and thus when someone tries, horrible outcomes result from their inability to accurately plan things. This is about as stupid as saying that traffic is too complicated to be planned, and everyone freely driving their car how they see fit would be best for everyone. Each time you put up a traffic light or a roundabout, it's going to cause horrible outcomes that you can't foresee. Hey, this is me in post-production. So while editing this video, I've also been reading some economics textbooks. One of them is called Principles of Microeconomics by N. Gregory Manku. I don't know if that's how you say his name. Uh, literally makes this case, right? So we're on page seven of this textbook. Principle four, people respond to incentives. The fourth paragraph talks about how Ralph Nader's Unsafe at Any Speed book in which he basically tears into the auto industry for being an uh, industry that makes machines that kill people. All of the safety regulations that resulted from that book, right, like mandatory seatbelts and other minimum safety requirements for cars, basically it argues they had no effect because uh, people being rational utility maximizers started driving uh, more unsafely and the same number of people died. That's ludicrous. That's absolutely fucking insane. They literally do think like this. They are off their rockers. The way to think like an economist is just whenever someone suggests changing the status quo, you come up with some bullshit fringe, well, sometimes nonsense, and that's it. That's literally it. If you want to see a bunch of people who think like neoclassical economists, uh, go watch the presidential libertarian debates. Should someone have to have a government-issued license to drive a car? Hell no! What's next? Requiring a license to make toast in your own damn toaster? <laughs> the license to drive? You know, I'd like to see some competency exhibited by people before they drive. These are fucking crazy people. Aside from this, though, apparently capitalist firms didn't get the message. Amazon and Walmart centrally plan all of their enterprises. Sears, on the other hand, was taken over by an anarcho-capitalist Ayn Rand fanboy who started implementing her ideas of internal competition and internal markets. I'll let you guess which system works. Ignoring all of that, though, modern computing has solved this issue of the economic calculation problem for entire economies. Even a desktop computer could be used to produce a plan based on real data of inputs and outputs of various locations. Your gaming rig could easily plan a 20 million commodity economy. Once the vast supercomputers available at Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, which are currently just being used to spy on people, along with the computers at the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, and the military, which are also being used just to spy on people, are considered, planning becomes almost trivial. Anyone could check the plan to make sure that it's in line with public priorities by simply running the planning program on their local computer. The plan can also be adjusted to assure minimal quality of life adjustments during the transition. We can say, don't let consumer consumption of certain goods fall below certain amounts. Don't let production of this fall too low, etc. And it's not going to be some nameless shady bureaucrats doing the planning either. I used to preach incredibly religiously against the problems of electronic voting, but Paul Cockshot has even developed a way around it, which would make it easy for everyone to participate directly in economic plan making. We call our system HandyVote. You start off by registering to vote. 
This is done by people getting a voting card. Voting itself can be done using either simple Nokia phones, smartphones, or in principle, though we've never tried this, landlines. At the end of the vote, all the results are shown and the votes are all inspectable by the general public to verify that the results have been correctly tallied. The experimental voting cards we've used look like this. They have a number to which you send a text message. They have your voting number, which will be unique. The voting number is divided into two fields. The first digits would be your unique identifier, and then there is a PIN number afterwards. You vote by sending an SMS message with your card ID. If your number was 44230796 and you wanted to vote yes to a question, you'd send 44230796 followed by a 1 for the yes, otherwise you follow it by 2 for a no. No one knows what your card ID is, so this is anonymous. At the end, the verification is by the publication of which card ID is which you voted which way. And you can look at this to check that your own vote was recorded directly. Only the leading digits are shown, but the leading digits are unique to your card. And when it comes to electronically voting for the economy, what's the worst that could happen? A small group of rich people try to influence the economic plan to benefit themselves and take control? Bro, that's called capitalism. I always find it very odd when people say that capitalism is incredibly efficient when they all admit that there's tons of work in society that needs to get done. Street sweeping, housing the homeless, caring for the sick, caring for the elderly, childcare, etc. And they also admit that there are millions of people who seemingly have nothing to do all day. The unemployed. So somehow the system that has loads of work that needs to be done but never gets done, and has millions of people who want to work but can't work, is the most efficient way of organizing a society? The only times that there have been incredible explosions in economic productivity and fast transformations of economies have been via central planning. More specifically, the central planning of investment. Under FDR, the federal government became heavily involved in all areas of the economy, the Soviet Union went from a country of entirely rural farmland to an electrified industrial superpower going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States and repelling the might of the Nazi war machine in 20 years. Japan was much the same story, a resource-poor island which became the second largest economy on Earth after being firebombed to rubble in World War II by the Americans. Even before World War II, World War I saw the governments of many countries get directly involved in economic planning. Whenever serious economic work needs to be done, it takes the form of either direct control by the state or private firms under the direction of strict state orders. This is actually something that Karl Marx predicted when he talked about departments of the economy, but that's a story for another time. A way to consider why this happens is to realize that markets, the other option aside from central planning, don't really exist. What part of the modern economy is actually a market? Farmers have contracts for regular shipments, and quotas with food manufacturers which they repeat year after year. Food manufacturers themselves have contracts for regular shipments with grocery stores. Customers who go to the grocery stores buy the same products each week. You have a contract with your landlord or your bank for your house. No market there. And if there was, it was one decision, years ago. No market for your cell phone, your electricity, water, sewage, garbage. Government work isn't done via the market anyway. If there is, it's during a bidding war, but much of that isn't done in the market anyway. There's usually just one bidder because of corruption. Where exactly are the markets? The closest I can think of is Wall Street, where nothing actually happens, so the markets are meaningless. In fact, all the times that people or businesses actually have to interact with a market, it's awful. Losing a regular customer with regular orders is a bad thing for business and would tank the stock price. Entire companies exist to handle the hassle and costs of markets. Talent recruiters, salesmen, apartment comparison websites, flight comparison websites, realtors and real estate agents. Nobody likes markets because they suck. They're risky and uncertain and costly and inefficient and so economies are planned around them. In fact, the economy isn't the market. The market is where the economy failed. The market is a temporary in-between state where the economy isn't functioning properly. When you know who your customer is going to be, when you know who your supplier is going to be, when you have an economic plan, that's business as normal. That's production. That's an economy. 
When you don't know either of those things, that's called the marketplace. Capitalists know this, by the way. It's why vertical integration is a thing, incorporating your entire supply chain to within your own enterprise so you have direct control and no markets to deal with. We have tried free market solutions, whatever that means, and market manipulation solutions for the past 70 years. Treaty after treaty, reduction goal after reduction goal, international agreement after international agreement, each was a failure. After each, CO2 emissions accelerated. Central planning isn't just better than the free market, it's our only option. Let's talk about a boat. I promise this is interesting. Nazi Germany had conquered just about all of its enemies on the European continent, and the United Kingdom needed supplies. The United States was supplying the island, but German U-boats were sinking ship after ship. The solution the United States came up with to supply the island was, quote, building ships faster than the Germans could sink them. 18 shipyards across the United States were called into action by the federal government in 1941 and under state direction and began mass production of a single type of ship. The design, named the Liberty Ship, was not new. It was not flashy. It was not fast. It was not perfect. It was better than perfect. It was standardized. The 11,000-ton deadweight, 440-foot-long ships would, however, become a symbol of the United States war planning industrial output. Between 1941 and 1945, 2,700 of these ships were produced. An average of one Liberty ship was completed and launched every 16 hours in the country. Crews became so skilled and knowledgeable of the entire production process of these ships that shifts would end with women handing tools off to their replacement without stop. At the start, it took crews 230 days to build a single one of these ships, but by 1943, they had gotten it down to 39, with an average of three ships launching each day from the country's ports. The record was the SS Robert E. Peary, a ship that was launched a grand total of four days and 15 and one half hours after its keel was laid down. And this is one example from one country, from one war, for one ship. To give some other examples, the Austrians planned their economy during World War I, as did the United States. The USSR planned its economy for its entire existence, and during World War II, despite having a smaller overall economy and facing millions of casualties, the Soviet planned economy outproduced and outfought Nazi Germany. We fought for the future, destroyed the invader, and brought to our homeland the laurels of fame. The scale of economic mobilization and planning that's needed by the government to stop climate change has been done before. If the era of slide rules and telegrams was able to accomplish planning feats like the ones I just mentioned, then the era of computers sure can. Or we're just going to get Boeing or some other defense contractor to design planes and spray aerosols into the atmosphere. Estimates put this at $8 billion a year, so it'll cost around $20 billion, probably. Military capitalists get a nice paycheck, then the Dems and Republicans get to have the military do something, which is always nice for them. The issue with CO2 is that too much solar energy gets trapped in the atmosphere. Aerosols just turn the sky white to prevent it from being trapped to begin with.